It's really a pleasure to be here on this platform. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about Indian handicrafts, about how handicrafts are relevant even in today's time and age. I believe, and not only I believe, many people before me who've come, who've studied, who've understood Indian handicrafts, think of them as epitome of design and success. I would like to talk about first the evolution. Indian handicrafts definitely started many, many, many years ago. We don't even know the exact dates of a whole lot of things. But how do we study any culture? How do we study any material culture? And how do we know about the values of any culture? Are by the kinds of books that are there, by the kinds of material that we hold. And every society, as we see, has a tangible culture and an intangible culture. And our knowledge about our knowledge, that is the kind of uh, knowledge that has been transferred, comes from a lot of sacred texts uh, and the religion was the way of life so it was not really a religion in that sense so a whole lot of knowledge about how you know, the philosophy is uh, and uh, about science about uh, humans about the behavior about rituals comes from the vedas and our knowledge of design our knowledge of our day-to-day -day material culture comes either from the materials that we see around us materials that are excavated uh, through archaeological finds, but also through some texts. They also come uh, in the form of sculpture, uh, paintings, and of late photography. But we also have our written resources, and our written sources are the Shastras, like the Vastu Shastra, the Shilp Shastra that come from long ago. After that, we have, um, you know, different rulers write it in their own way. Akbar has written a lot on Indian handicraft, and then we have a lot of information also available to us from the very recent time period, which is the British rule. It is very easy to say that, yes, they came here and they captured us. But when we look at it, some of them also really valued Indian handicraft. And because of that, it led to the whole uh, you know, British rule, etc., because they wanted to take the material that we have. All of them, whether it is the British, whether it's the Indian or the uh, medieval time period, whatever it is, Everywhere, what we see is we do not separate art, design, and craft in India. In India, art, craft, and design are together, and that is why one word, shil, defines it. And today, we talk a lot about sustainability. But when you try and look for a Hindi word for sustainability, it's very difficult to find. There's only one word, which is called sthirta, which means there is something which is meant to be, which will stay. The whole reason is that our crafts evolved in such a way that they were sustainable that they had a wonderful element of art, design, and craftsmanship. When I look at any Indian craft, and I'll call it Indian art, design, or craft, what do I see? So there are three most important things. One, I see it is functional. It serves a purpose. We did not have a drawing room culture. We didn't want things just to you know, clutter the drawing room. Everything was functional. Everything was sustainable environmentally, economically sustainable it was long lasting why economically because it gave livelihood to so many people there were people associated with every craft and it is those people they were not daily wage workers they were craftsmen they created on their own they thought on their own and they made a functional thing which was sustainable which was also aesthetically pleasing it's not that i have a glass uh, to drink water and it doesn't look good it was also aesthetically pleasing. It was something which is hand done, which has an expression. It has an inspiration. It fosters creativity and is designed to satisfy a particular need. And it is very sustainable. Also, like I said, because it's long lasting, it's environmental friendly, and it also gives a lot of uh, job opportunities to a whole lot of people. And I don't think, if I think back about earlier times, you know, when people were divided into guilds uh, and uh, different uh, crafts and people worked, I don't think there would have been cases of joblessness. The, the reason for this talk is how can we bring it back? How can we make sure that this is, uh, you know, how our life is and this is how we would want it to be? Four years ago, uh, you know, I went to a place called Rakhigadi where there were excavations happening. And uh, they told me that the civilization is probably 8,000 years old. And uh, when they were digging, they found amazing things. They found pottery. Uh, and, you know, they found a variety of pots. And every time when we uh, 
you know, find material that is archaeologically uh, there for us to see, for us to understand. Um, I've always admired the shape of a matka. Uh, you know, why is it that it is like that? Uh, uh, why this shape has continued for so long? And why is it that it is, uh, you know, a shape which people really make? What is the use of this shape? And incidentally, I came across, uh, uh, long ago, I came across this report written by Charles and Ray Eames, which talks about the design of a lota. So Charles and Ray Eames, uh, these were the people whom the government of India had called to India to set up the institute called NID today. So what they write in their report is, of all the objects we have seen and admired during our visit to India, the lota, that simple vessel of everyday use, stands out as perhaps the greatest, the most beautiful. And what do they say? And I quote, that the way it is to be transported, it's the best. You know, you can put it on your head. You can, uh, you know, hold it. Uh, you can, uh, you know, hold it at the side. So head, hip, hand, basket or cart. Very easy to tie, very easy to carry. So transport, that's important. When people traveled, they needed something to carry water in. So transport was easy. Two, the balance, center of gravity. So even when it's empty, it stands straight. Even when it's full, it has a wonderful balance. It's half full. Even then, it has a wonderful balance. So at any given point of time, it has a wonderful center of gravity and its balance is excellent. Even when you rotate it, when you pour it, there's excellent balance. The third thing they say is that the fluid dynamics of the problem, not only when pouring, but when filling and cleaning. So you can put your hand inside and you can clean the entire uh, you know, utensil. Uh, and under complicated motions of head carrying, slow and fast, whatever you need, it's a very, very interesting design, thought out so well. It's sculpture as it fits the palm of the hand or the curve of the hip. It's sculpture as complement to the rhythmic motion of walking or a static post at the well. The relation of opening to volume in terms of storage. You know, so the opening is small, but the storage is large and the objects other than liquid. So it can store any kind of object. But the interesting thing, what I find is it can store a lot, but because the opening is small, when it spills, a lot does not come out immediately. The size of opening and the in, inner contours in terms of cleaning, then heat transfer. Can you not hold it even when it's hot? You've used the small kulhars, so you don't need an extra handle. Nothing extra is needed. You don't have to really add on things to it. It is a complete shape in itself. So beautiful, easy to carry, easy to hold, it can hold a whole lot of material. Its center of gravity is amazing. And what they say is such a design can only come about with years of evolution. This shape is the best shape, whether you need to transport, whether you need to store, whether you need to clean, whatever you need to do. So I think Indian design is what we now really need to focus on. We need to go back to things that why are they the way they are? What is it that has preserved this shape for thousands of years? You know, and that merits discussion, debate, intelligence, thinking about things, design thinking as we call it. We see that not only in terms of products, in terms of clothes, they were very functional, they were sustainable, and they were aesthetically pleasing. So let us say you have a pagri and you're traveling somewhere, but you want to lie down or you want to dust something, you open it and you use it. You carry something in a bag, which is not a stitched bag, but a portly, and then you open it and you can use the fabric for something else. Let us say you have a sari which you are wrapping around your body. Whether you gain a few inches or lose a few inches, it doesn't really matter. You know, so it's very, very sustainable. You can use that fabric for a longer time. Now, this I'm talking about fabrics which were, you know, off the loom, which were made into garments by drapery. When we talk about stitched fabric, the stitched fabrics like the lehenga, choli, jama, kurta, they're all Indian zero waste patterns. You know, because the rectangular piece of fabric has been cut so beautifully and stitched so beautifully that there is almost zero fabric wastage. It is not contoured to your body in the way the modern clothing is, but it is stitched with kalis and stitched in a manner where it utilizes the entire fabric. So a lot of times people would cut up the shawl and stitch a kind of, uh, you know, a jama or a kind of kurta, a kalidar kurta, and they would use every piece of fabric. Today, what we do? We wear very tight clothing, which fits our body. And the moment we increase in size one or two inches, that garment is a waste, completely wasted.
um, look at trousers and look at salwar. So salwar has a tie here. So if a lady becomes pregnant, she can, you know, uh, sort of tie it that way. And if she's not, she can just pull it. So that is how it is a zero waste pattern. Uh, but today we don't do that. So, but we really need to go back to zero waste pattern because the amount of fabric wastage that is happening, uh, even the paper industry is not able to convert everything to pulp. But earlier, when we look at our earlier designs, and why am I pointing out back to the earlier? Because we have to learn from there. We've lost certain things. We have to go back and learn from there. This is how our patterns used to be. This is how our clothing used to be. It was good for our climate. It was good for sustainability. It was good for the earth. And it served all our purposes. We do not live in an environment where we need stitched clothing, which is so tight all the time. And when we do that, then we need air conditioners. Rather, we wear dhotis, which are so cool, so comfortable. You won't have all kinds of skin allergies too. But we've left all of that behind. So I think we really need to revisit that. And that is why it's important for us to understand that Indian handicrafts evolved into something which we've lost, which we now need to uh, you know, continue. Uh, it was lost. It's not really lost, I must say. It's still living. But it's gone down to a greater degree because of the reason of uh, industrial revolution that came in instead of industrial evolution. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that Indian crafts were of two types, one for commerce and trade and one for personal use. So for commerce and trade, they were commercial, they were material based, and we had our people who were designers and craftsmen. So the craftsman was a designer in himself. His family was a part of it. It was a larger unit. They worked in various departments together. Their wives were assistants or they handled parts of production. Children were apprentices. In villages or in cities, the head of the family was also an entrepreneur. He could employ labor to produce more. He was also a scientist since he knew the material well and the technology. He was a designer because he knew the requirements of his clients. He was an artist because his work was aesthetically pleasing. He was a craftsman and artisan. He had the skill to make it himself. He, he could make it more beautiful if more time and energy went into it. And thus it could cost more. So based on who is going to buy uh, the product, you could work on it. And based on that, people were called as potters, weavers, metallurgists, leather dwellers, sculptor, uh, leather workers. Uh, and in Hindi, the local names were Kumhar, Bunkar, Luhar, Chamar, Sunar, Shilpkar, all these people, each artisan, each craftsperson. I don't even know whether I should call them artisan. They are all in one. They are scientists. A potter knows about the material. He understands that this is the earth with which I can create this kind of material, but not this kind of an object. So he knew the science behind it. He knew the design. He had the skill to create it. Why can't we go back there? That is the focus of today's talk. We need to go back. We need to understand. We are producing a culture of designers who want to sit on the table and create something, but they do not have complete understanding. And that is why we really need to focus on it holistically. The person has to know science. The person has to know the arts. He has to be a designer. He has to understand the client. He has to understand the requirement and create a product accordingly. And the more we get into mass production, we lose this. And mass production, I feel, should be by the masses, not for the masses. So that's also important. So Indian crafts were largely for commerce and trade. But then there were many crafts that were personal crafts. And it was for personal use and gifts for birth or marriage. So many crafts were not commercial. They were done by people to add value to their homes or to their clothes. They were done with immense love. They included depiction of stories, of hope, of wishes, and had a more personal touch. These were usually done by women in their free time. Embroideries like kantha, fulkari, kasuti, so on and so forth, were all done by women, either for themselves or for their daughters or for gifts. They did kolam on the floor every morning, you know, in South India, if you see, they decorate their floor with beautiful kolams. In Rajasthan, women made mandana on the walls and on the floor. Uh, Madhubani, Gond, Wali, these were all paintings which were done for personal use. They were not commercial crafts. They were done by tribals to tell their stories, to depict their lives and wishes. They used natural colors. So a beautiful thing uh, they told me when I asked them, they said, uh, you know, that it is rice flour and it is uh, spread on the floor in a beautiful manner so that it looks good. Your house looks decorated and it's a feed for the ants. So the ants can come. We rever every person. We rever every animal. We rever every human being. That's what our culture teaches us. 
So when we have those ants there, they can come and eat that rice flour. So we, it is for them. So we make it fresh every morning. Don't you see that this is so beautiful and it is all being now replaced by commercial culture? I hardly find a mother who embroiders something for her daughter today. They can only buy. They will buy and gift because this love is only depicted by how expensive you can buy today. But that was not the case earlier. And I think it will be wonderful if we can go back to it, if we can personalize our gifts ourselves rather than having agencies to personalize gifts for us. And here I would also like to add that um, there's a wonderful book called Evolution of Indian uh, Crafts and Indian Industry. And where we see how in the early 19th century, uh, you know, because of the coming in of the Industrial Revolution from the West to India, uh, where they would uh, manufacture clothes and sell it, send it back to us, we lost a lot of uh, our handicrafts and we began losing them almost 200 years ago. And uh, uh, there, were, there were crafts that were done in cities and there were crafts that were done in villages. We've lost that distinction now. It's only a, a kind of a, a, a place where we try and help and we buy out of pity for craftsmen. And I think we should change that. We don't need to pity anybody. They have to produce good, good goods and we need to buy them. Today, we look at these designs and we only prize them for their motives. Okay, it looks good, so let's copy it. Let's do a graphic design with this. Let's do something like that. But then all of this had a, a beginning, a reason, and that is how uh, you know they evolved. So not only uh, you know static art or craft or things of use, Indian crafts were also a mode of communication. Today we talk of circular economy, and I think I can't give a better example than this. Here I have a picture of Pabuji Kafar, which is painted in Rajasthan. It's a visual story. It's like a story book. You know how we had Amar Chitrakata, but there. Uh, there were these blobs for people to tell, uh, to speak to each other, and we could understand what they're talking about. But here, these are painted scrolls, like, you know, they're all painted. It's a visual story. And then there's a bhopa, a bard, who sings the songs in the praise of the hero of the story. And his wife usually has a diya in her hand, and she points out to characters, as in when he talks about those characters, when he recites poetry. So it's an audiovisual medium. It's a great form of communication. So, and if we look at the kind of livelihoods, somebody will commission it, somebody will paint it. So you have a whole culture of painting this in vegetable dyes, telling the story. And then uh, there is a whole, uh, uh, you know, craft of narrating it. How do you talk about it? How do you narrate? How do you engage people in this? And then the best part is they were never stored in museums. You know, they were used for a long time and then they just were, uh, you know, put into the river or when they had finished their life and new ones were painted. Each state like this has its own style of cloth painted narratives. There's Patichitra, there are Cherial, Kalamkari, Matani Pachkiri. You have lots of them. And the crafts were alive because they were kept alive by the community. And I think they are skills that have been acquired over centuries. If we just lose them to the Industrial Revolution, we might just end up having a whole lot of people who are just running around for jobs and can't create anything themselves, can't think of anything, and just want to run in a fast-paced life, not take life the way it is meant to be in a country like India. Thank you so much.